So Sarah Farmer is somebody that I've wanted to get on the podcast for you guys for quite some time because she is somebody who helps people perform in the big moments. She's a renowned executive coach, has a fantastic energy, and is somebody who gets an incredible helper's high from helping people unlock their potential, whether that's if you're out interviewing or if you're running a business or if you're just looking to become a better leader. Sarah does it all. She's so open in this podcast, which I really appreciated in terms of sharing her own story and being very, very generous with tips around how you can give yourself a software refresh in terms of your mind and perform better and get out of your own way. So no matter what your career situation, I know you're going to get so much from this and I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback. So without further ado, welcome to the Executive Career Jump podcast. And today we've got Sarah Farmer. Let's get to work. You're listening to the Career Jump podcast. Insights, interviews, and success stories to inspire and give you the edge when you make your next career jump. Hosted by your career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. Hello, welcome back to the Executive Career Jump podcast. I'm your host and career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. We've got a very interesting day here in the UK because there's big storms outside. So we're all hunkered up and hiding in today. But somebody that really helps people, whatever the weather, is Sarah Farmer. And we've invited Sarah on to share some uh, of her insights with us today. So thanks for joining us, Sarah. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you for having me. And it's lovely to meet you properly as well. Yeah. So again, another kind of LinkedIn connection that's now moving more into an interactive connection. So anyone listening... Start building relationships on LinkedIn. We are proof in point. Got to do it. We are proof in point. Um, for anyone who hasn't come across your work, Sarah, are you happy just to tell us a little bit more about the type of stuff you get involved with, please? Yeah, absolutely. And having just had a conversation with you about this, I'm going to try and keep it more, more succinct. So I'm an executive coach, which means that I work with leaders at second line leader and above, helping them manage their mindset, learn the skills that they need um, to improve their business, but also their own personal results. So the words we were using earlier were sort of about empowering people to be the very best they can be whenever they need it, getting them ready for anything. And that pretty much encapsulates it. So thank you for that. I'll take that one. Yeah. Improving confidence and competence, really whatever level they're at. And I said to you earlier, I don't just work with senior level leaders. I do some work with some more junior leaders as well, first line leaders. And they're they are so much fun to work with because they are open books, sponges, and they don't have this, sometimes the senior leaders have a feeling of being very exposed and vulnerable, whereas the ones coming into it don't. And trying to help these people grow their skills and confidence before they hit that next level, I think is going to make a massive difference to how leaders are seen and how successful they are in the future. Absolutely. Very important work indeed. And I know from talking to you that you really enjoy it as well. You get very fulfilled with the work that you're doing. That's very obvious. What is it about what you do that brings you that fulfillment? Oh, that's such a great question. People can see how excited I get when it's going. What I really love, and, and this comes from my own experience, is that I won't go through my childhood and everything else, but I grew up with imposter syndrome. I grew up feeling like I was not quite right, square peg, round hole. This impacted how I behaved at work. It impacted all of my relationships. And now I know how to get out of that and the difference it makes when you are away from that mindset and you start to believe in yourself. Helping other people do that, that are suffering with what I suffered with and seeing them literally break free of these shackles of self-doubt or lack of skill or whatever it is and go for the things they really want to go for, say the things they really want to say, achieve what they really want to achieve. Honestly, it gives me goosebumps and, and I get paid for it. And I think that's the difference is I don't go to work to be paid. I go to work for that. And then I get paid. I mean, pinch me. It, I know. It, as someone who loves that sort of stuff, it's the best job in the world. I get it. Well, of course I get it. I think we're very sport in that way because yeah, I think the more you help people get what they want, the more you get what you want anyway. I think that's no doubt about that. Absolutely. It's a real joy, a real, a real privilege as well, actually, because people really let you in when they're feeling quite vulnerable. And for people to say, I don't know this, especially if they're senior leaders, you know, that's quite a vulnerable moment for them. So you, you feel very privileged to be allowed into that space where they could feel pretty, Ooh, I'm not sure I should be saying, I don't know this. Absolutely. And when you get that 
I got the promotion or I got the job or I managed to sort that problem I told you about text. What does that feel like? Well, I get so excited. I feel, I must learn not to do this quite so much. I feel like it's mine. <laughs> it's quite personal. Yeah. You, you build up such a strong relationship with these people and you genuinely care about them and what happens to them. And when it doesn't go right, you're there for them. And when it does go right, you're there for them. And two people that I work very closely with at the moment, one well, not a client, have both just got jobs. And I'm just ecstatic for them. You know, I, I will have a drink for them and I don't drink. So that's how good it is. <laughs> yeah, that help us high. It's very addictive, that help us high. Oh, yeah. Um, don't you men- rush. Yeah. You mentioned your own imposter syndrome that you'd faced throughout your life and your career. So I wonder if we could go back to that. How did you manage to overcome that? And because I don't sense that you still have it now. Ah, uh-huh. Well, the, the funny thing about imposter syndrome is that a lot of us who have it hide it incredibly well. And we get away with it for a while, but a lot of us don't hide it. So I would say that you are never cured. I always have a sense of really. <laughs> and I think that's there's a part of being humble, but not too humble and having an unshakable belief, which you grow through learning about yourself, which I did a lot of a lot of introspection, a lot of coaching, a lot of self-development, a lot of reading, a lot of practicing and learning to really know how to make decisions and where my decision making is coming from. So there's something I do with all of my clients, which I learned from another course, actually, which was about how, I mean, I know how to do it, but they put it into this easy to follow format where they show you that the results that you get, mixture of the actions and the mindset that you have, everyone focuses on action. If I change this, if I change this, it'll work. The results will change, but they'll never be as brilliant if your mindset and forming those actions isn't brilliant. And what I learned was when you dig down into where your mindset comes from, into this space much, much lower, you know, it's really quite deep. And that isn't that we go into counselling, we just look at where these things have come from and challenge them for what they really are. So if I believe a, a great one is, I'm no good at maths, I can't do maths. When did you learn that? How do you know that? Who told you that? And is it really true? And people are like, well, no, actually, I know all my times tables. I'm not that. So you start to put new beliefs in. And I am now very good as a coach of myself to catch myself when I dip into, oh, you shouldn't, you couldn't, you wouldn't, to hold on. How do you know that? Yes, you could. Reframe. Off we go. But I'm very well practiced at it now. So it's easier, I guess, for me to do. But this is what I do with my clients. And that's the, it's almost like a seal breaker. As soon as that seal's gone, then you layer in all of the skills and the competencies on top of that. And then people are just powerhouses. So that's what I did was everything I'm doing with my clients, I've learned and I've practiced with amazing coaches and support along the way. Yeah, I love that. Well, you should never work with a coach who hasn't had or doesn't have a coach is one of the bits of advice I give to people. It's amazing how many don't. Yeah, I'm intrigued. And how could I possibly say it was a good thing if I didn't have one? Or several, as the case may be on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on where we're at. Yeah, well, no, I agree. Absolutely. So this kind of software refresh that you're giving people, it's like an update that's done to a laptop in some ways. You're kind of taking out the old, putting in the new, this software refresh, as I would call it. What are the common things that tend to hold people back from performing well in the big moments? Fear. Mm. Fear of the unknown, fear of it going wrong, fear of what might happen, fear, fear, fear. And this all comes from, and I've learned a lot about neuroscience over the last eight years. It's really fascinated me. I'm, I'm a scientist by background anyway. I've got a degree in applied chemistry, which was one of those moments where I was pinching myself going, me? What? Surely? I was told I was rubbish at school. But so I've got a real science head and I don't do fluffy coaching. It's all based on fact and science with a lot of empathy underneath it, of course. But knowing what's happening in your brain and knowing how we make decisions and knowing that every change that's coming our way or every possible what could be perceived as a difficult, uncomfortable situation initiates the same response as it would do to a Neanderthal man being faced by a saber toothed tiger. When I realized that, it became very clear why people get stuck and have this fear response, which makes them do the most bizarre things in interviews or just speaking to people or when they're under pressure. When you understand that, you can start to manage it better. And this is what, so when people are going into a situation where they really get stuck, 
it's because they haven't understood the fear response. And when they do, when you start to understand it, you can start to do something different about it. And that's where all of the work starts there. And that's what does the refresh. But when you talk about it being sort of an old software, our brains are running on really old software. They're running on million, billion years old software. But our rational brain, which has developed over time, is there to protect us. But it kicks in after the emotional response has kicked in, which is the innate one. So learning how to allow your rational brain, it's getting very scientific now, is it? Learning how to allow your rational brain to have a say in what your emotional brain's doing is a real skill that anyone can choose to learn. And that's what takes you into this unshakable belief territory and away from imposter syndrome or self-limiting beliefs. Love it. Absolutely love it. And I've wondered, uh, I'm um, not as clued up on these topics as you whatsoever, but um, I've wondered whether we're all actually descendants from highly anxious people because by, by nature for us to have survived, we are probably most likely to be ancestors of people that ran away from danger rather than to it, right? We, we all are. We right. are. We are it's, that's exactly it. Our brain has two functions. Well, both it's to keep us alive. But how it does it is you've got what they call the reptilian brain, which is your, you know, your breathing and all the autonomic functions that keep us alive to keep that going. So make sure we've got enough energy for that. And the other one is run away from danger or stay very still and go invisible. Mm. both are saving uh, sort of body brain saving actions so we all come from that which is why it was such a light bulb moment for me and for all of the clients that I work with when they figured that out it's like I get it you know, I can see now it's not me being a weirdo or just being really negative and that's actually quite a relief in itself because often people think I'm just really low and I just, I'm just one of those people that just thinks negatively, I can't help it. You're not, it's really normal, but we can break the cycle. Yeah, I love that. It's so interesting the, the, how critical we are to ourselves in a way that we wouldn't be to other people, isn't it? Why do you think that is and how do you kind of help people break out of that? So what, what do you mean by that? Is What's the question behind the question there? <laughs> well, you just said that you, you give some examples there of where people are kind of judging their own behaviour and kind of going, go, oh, why am I doing this? And go, oh, why am I doing this? And oh, you're useless. Like, I feel like that inner critic can be quite loud. And we're so critical of ourselves compared to other people. Massively. So, so yeah, sorry, I understand. So this is, I talk about leaking quite a lot and we all leak and there's, there's something else going on in our brains just in the side. There's an ability of my brain to pick up what's going on in your brain, even when you don't want me to. And we think we're hiding it well, but we're leaking this all the time. So if we think about it, especially for your, you know, the people that work with you looking for new jobs, when you're going into an interview situation, if you are leaking, I'm nervous, I'm worried, I'm not good enough, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too, whatever, or I don't believe in myself. The person on the other side, because of what's going on in their brain, will pick up something that gives them, them a fear response it's not just bad for us it's bad for everybody around us because we feel it and I don't know about you you'll probably you've met somebody and in your gut you're thinking something doesn't feel right mm. what it is but you think of that as a recruiter something doesn't feel right thank you bye-bye mm. I don't even care what it is I just know it doesn't feel right and I'll tell you the culture wasn't right or you weren't a culture fit or something spurious and we go what you were pipped at the post. That's, uh, what, that's one of the classics. You nearly got it, but you were scaring me. And I don't mm. say that. And I think this is why also recruiters find it so hard to give feedback is they don't understand this either. And I feel a bit sorry for them, not all of them, some of them, where they can't give great feedback because they don't know what it is that bothered them. They have no idea. No, the lack of training. A whole other podcast, but it's lack of training is a big part problem there. Maybe that's another uh, area we can go into. <laughs> so coming back to you and your journey then, because I'm interested to bring to life your own journey and where you've come. You mentioned the science degree, and we know today that you're a well-known executive coach. Fill in the middle for us. Well, how has your career panned out? So from my degree, I went straight into pharmaceuticals. And I have to say the pharmaceutical industry was the best playground in the world to learn Everything that I do now, all the soft skills, you get the best training, the best support. It wasn't perfect, but it was brilliant. And I did sales, did really well in sales. I did a managerial role. And then I went into training, which was home. It felt like home. I knew I'd landed. 
And I always knew from then on, that's what I love to do was to help people. From then, I took, had children. Oh, no, before I had children, I went into the IT industry for a little while. Now, that was a massive, a massive eye opener. I've never been treated so badly. Mm. Actually, thinking back to my self-limiting beliefs, that really super fueled it. Mm. It made me quite ill. It was a very hardcore, harsh environment where you could earn a lot of money, but they treated you pretty roughly. I chose to leave there. And that was the first time I ever did something that I thought was super powerful. I walked in and said, no, thank you. Not anymore. Had nothing to go to. Didn't care. That was like, wow, that was a super powerful moment. Where did you find that strength? I knew I was worth more. I knew my mental health was suffering. I was also having, I got counselling. I'm not scared to admit it. A lot of people are like, oh, you had counselling. You must be a nutter. No, I just wanted to know what was going on in my head. And that was where my other love for coaching came in, was watching that going on. And I realised that I was worth more. I didn't need to be treated like that. I didn't want to be treated like that. And it was starting to affect me, not just mentally, but physically. Mm, it- but it's all interconnected, isn't it? So that's a really powerful point. So there, I believe that, all the surveys suggest there are huge, huge amounts of people that are in that exact position in their careers in particular right now, where they're in almost self-imposed prison of some type that's keeping them stuck. What would you say to them if somebody's listening to this podcast who's getting those Sunday dreads, who's on the road to burnout, but feels trapped and low in confidence, which is stopping them kind of breaking out of their situation what would you say to them if they're listening first of all I'd say I'm really sorry you feel like that because I know how it feels it's a horrible horrible thing I think most of us will feel that like that at some stage however the people that come to me with this problem it's so severe at this point because they've taken it's taken almost too long to speak to someone about it that they are in such a state of fear and dread of moving away from the pain and just as an aside I will ask the question but if you think about I often say to them you think about people that have battered wives battered husbands they stay where they are even though it hurts because the familiarity feels safe and they start to lose all their self-confidence so and it's pretty much the same thing you're almost drawn to the pain because it's familiar and we love familiarity so what I would say to people is the second you start to feel that start doing something now Mm. you've left it till it's later don't worry we can help you but if you're starting to feel that do something now think about what you're worth think about what you really want start looking for plan b start making it happen have a plan c always be looking for opportunities always be networking show up because you never know when you're going to need people and how they might need you so i hope that answers the question is but i would say act sooner rather than later and get help 100 percent prevention rather than cure i think it's sometimes when people are coming to either our organization or yours there it's a long way back for them isn't it and you just almost all of them will say to you won't they oh we should have done this sooner like that's they that- all do they yeah. all i just give you one example as well andrew there's somebody that i was working with up until quite recently who came to me who wasn't happy at work was feeling trapped she did like where she worked she was really enjoying it but she wasn't getting the promotion that she wanted, which then starts to feed into this. I'm not getting it because I'm rubbish. You start to have these self-limiting beliefs. You start to feel negative. She was almost going in on herself. You could see it. It was really quite disturbing. And then what I got her to do was to go and speak to the people that were going to tell her yes or no, you will be promoted. You have longevity here. Cause that was the one question she could not ask because she knew the answer. She did that. It hurt. She ripped the plaster off. She's now looking for another job because now she knows Mm. the fear of not knowing and not asking the hard questions is worse than knowing. I promise you, because then you have a choice. Then you've got freedom to choose. That's powerful. So, yeah, it's I can't remember what you just asked me, but I had to tell you that story. (laughs) I love that story. Yeah, I love that story. We would accept certain misery to avoid temporary uncertainty. That's what's crazy. Very well put. Very well put. We do. And it's again back to this old software. It's better to be slightly uncomfortable, but be safe in your uncomfortableness because we like predictable things, even if they hurt us. If it's predictable, I know what's coming. I can deal with it. 
And when you watch people break free from predictability and embrace change with a confidence and competence to do it, that is when you see people go, just take off. And that doesn't happen for everybody. It's a really low percentage of people that do it because they don't think they can. They don't get the help to tell them that they're wrong. They can't afford it. They think they can't afford it. They choose not to afford it. There's all sorts of reasons why. But if you're in a place where you can get help, be it free, be it paid for something, read books. There's so much to read on it. The self-help out there do something because you've got one life. And I just know, I think hitting 50 last year really made me realize that it's not, you know, Simon Sinek talks about an infinite game. Our life isn't an infinite game. It's one game. You have one chance. And I'm, you know, damn well gonna have a ball till for however long it lasts. And when you go there, everything becomes fun. Scary but fun <laughs> yeah totally the stoics talk about memento more don't they which is basically a reminder you are going to die so so all this time i know a lot of people got me onto the idea of having sand timers around the house which i've got now to remind me that it's time slipping away and to make use of what we're doing and i love having those visual reminders yeah. for those days where i'm feeling sloppy or i'm not on it or i'm in a negative zone looking at the sand slipping away in front of your eyes is a great way to remind you of what's going on it is, but there's also this other bit is I talk about resilience quite a lot is people think I must be positive. I must make the most of every moment. And actually, if we do that, that's exhausting. And I absolutely believe we need to feel all emotions. So I do allow myself to go into the doom of despair occasionally, but I won't allow myself to stay there very long. But I allow myself to dip in and out of things. Otherwise, I become inhuman. Mm. And it's too much of a challenge and I'm really good at going there. So why not give myself a treat occasionally? <laughs> <laughs> you're not judging yourself there either. I think no. that's what's powerful about what you've just said. You're not judging yourself, are you? It's taking the judgment away. It's saying, I know there are X amount of emotions a human's supposed to have, and I'm going to allow myself to feel them, but I won't allow myself to stay anywhere where it's going to cause me harm for too long. And for me, that's excitement as well. I get so excited so quickly and I'm into everything I'm a real fast thinker that I have to remember to bring myself back from there as well it's mm. like you are going to burn out if you stay up there too long mm. so it's it's this, fun up there though isn't it so, it's, <laughs> it's fun it's fun and the dopamine release oh, and a little bit of that every day is wonderful but you know moderation it's a bit like chocolate you wouldn't eat it every minute of every day would you because mm, no annoying me um, <laughs> Okay, great. Fantastic. I just want to switch lanes a little bit then whilst we've got the opportunity to uh, get some advice from you. So job searching, I know you've helped lots of people get hired the same as we have. And obviously it won't surprise you that a lot of the listeners to this might be in some kind of career transition or having been made redundant or something like that. Talk us through it. What are your top tips for people who are job searching right now? What should they be thinking about? Top tips, gosh, there's, there's a lot. And so my, my stuff is very different to yours, isn't it? It's, I think you do all of the, the real structure around it, but also a huge amount of confidence and support, uh, which actually is massive, isn't it? Without that, without feeling safe that someone's got your back. Hey, everybody. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I wanted to tell you very quickly about how Executive Career Jump can help end your career misery. So when you hit our website, there's three different ways that our digital resources can help you. For a start, if you're looking to jump in to a new role, we've got the premier online job search course that you're going to find anywhere. There's a number of different memberships to help you understand what you want and how to go and get it in this current environment. So we're here to help you if you want a new career. We've also got a, a section if you want to jump up in your career. And so this is all about our online leadership hub, which is a platform full of content, includes uh, two meetups per quarter and a whole thriving community of leaders trying to become the best leaders they can be go and check that out too and the third area in our website and the other digital course that might help you is our business launcher course so we've created the business launcher program that we wish we had when we were setting up on their own so if you've decided to jump off of the employment stream and start up on your own make sure you head over and check that out too you can find all of these resources a bunch of free content links to previous podcasts and more at execcareerjump.com that's E-X-E-C careerjump.com. Now, 
back to the pod. So Sarah's back. For anyone on YouTube who's wondering why my shirt's changed and we've got different flowers behind us and Sarah's had an outfit change. This wasn't some strange team building exercise that we <laughs> that we conjured up while she was away. Actually, when we recorded the first half of this podcast, the storms came in towards the end of February, which were very well documented. Sarah had a power cut. I did. And you were laughing at me doing a very old school thing of having a flask of hot boiling hot water just in case. Oh, how you laughed. And then when I came up, I went, thank goodness for the flask. I could at least have a cup of tea. Uh, so, yeah, sorry about that. It was uh, beyond my control. Yeah, so that left us with two options. We could have uh, published the podcast how it was because it was excellent. There was loads involved, but I still had so many questions for Sarah. So she's very kindly agreed to come back on for another 10, 15 minutes to finish the episode off and to talk about a couple of other topics. So thank you, first of all, for agreeing to do that or a big move of some type and now find themselves out of work. I'm wondering what your top tips are for anyone listening who finds himself in that situation at the moment and what they can be focusing on. Oh, good question. There are so many, aren't there? And the biggest one, I think, is, and this is easier said than done, is don't panic. Because what happens is when you panic and start to see all the, all the reasons why it was your fault, it's gone wrong, what does this mean about me? You'd start going into what I call this doom looping spiral, this sort of, oh my God, everything's doom, doom, doom. And often it can be the best thing that's ever happened to you. So you have a choice of mindset here is, do I believe this is the worst thing that's ever happened? Oh my goodness, everything's going to be awful. Or could I see this as an opportunity instead? How exciting something new is about to happen. Now I know underneath all of that, people are going, it's easy for you to say, you know, you're not having to worry about paying the bills and this, that, and the other. Of course that is all normal, but it's when it gets out of control and all we can focus on is the, am I, I'm not gonna swear, because oh crap, but the oh dear thought, yeah, it wasn't too bad, was it? The, oh my goodness, this is awful. We can, it stops us, it almost switches off our ability to see what is possible. And that then leaks out in all the interviews that we have or the job searches we go on, because we come at it from a, I'm desperate, I'm really nervous. And that is not a good place to be because the recruiter will be picking that up. So I think that's my number one, and there's loads more, but that's the key. For that me. leaking out bit again, yeah. So what about interviews? When you're working with clients, what type of advice do you give them prior to going into an interview scenario? Okay, again, quite a bit to go on before that is think about, the, the, what I get my clients to do is to think about their own communication style first. So first of all, we work on the mindset, making sure that you're not in a negative mindset uh, zone, because if you are, you are not going to be answering questions, listening to questions well enough to be able to answer them properly. How you communicate, biggest thing ever, the one of the easiest ways to lose trust is to communicate differently to somebody else. That doesn't mean you have to change who you are, but it does mean be very aware of who you're going into or the board of people you're going into and be prepared to be versatile. A lot of people don't understand what that is. They think that's turning themselves into something they were never before and it isn't. It's just dialing up and dialing down different parts of your communication. So if I've come to meet you and you're really quiet and reserved and I come in and go, whoa, hi, interview, well, awesome, I'm a massive expressive, you're immediately gonna hate me and you can't help it. It's not that you hate me, but you hate my behavior, which makes you dislike me. So being able to communicate in those first few minutes and those first few seconds in a way where you ooze confidence and calm, but communicate it in a way that allows everyone else to calm down, you're already off to a, a great start. So the communication piece is massive. I'm amazed how many people haven't learned that. I've come from a corporate background where everybody learned it. Mm. And then when they do, they're like, whoa, oh, that's easy. I can do this. And people have probably had to do it before in terms of when they're leading their own team, you know. Of course, yeah. Haven't, haven't they? So it's kind of a, they've probably got that skill there, haven't they? Because they've had to adapt their style to the individuals they lead. But this is about adapting it to an audience. Would that well, be? you say they, they have had to, but I guarantee they, if they have, it's unconsciously. So what we're doing is bringing it to the conscious mind because... When you're under pressure and going into an interview, if your mindset isn't, oh, this is exciting, it's a meeting of minds versus, oh God, I really need this because I need to pay my bills. You are less able to control your baseline communication preference. So if I am naturally massively, massively expressive and I'm under pressure, I will come in and be massively expressive. My ability to tone down, dial up, dial down things is reduced because my 
emotional self-control is being messed with because I'm nervous. So it all goes together. And most of the time people will go, oh yeah, I've done that. But it's doing it on purpose when you need to, when you're under pressure is a different skill altogether. Mm, it is a different skill altogether. So how can we master that skill? Oh, come talk to me. <laughs> uh, it's a training course. I mean, you, you go on a training course, you have to learn about it. One of the first things I would do is to find someone, you can come to me and get this done, but just find somewhere where you can do a profile of what your preferences are. So there's things like DISC, Insights, um, you can get hold of these. And if you can't come to me, I can help you do it. I'll just send you somewhere to get one. And you can look at your preferences and then you can do some reading. I'm sure there's free courses out there. You can chat to people that know about this stuff or you can get some coaching on it and some teaching on it or go on a course, but learn where you're coming from, where your baseline is how to help other people feel more comfortable when you're talking to them and low attention, when and where you need to do it. Because one misconception is that if I have to change who I am, I have to do it all the way through the interview. You don't, you only do it when in times of, when there's pressure or tension. So right at the start, and then if there's an objection or something that worries people, you might have to do it again. It's just a tension lowering tool. And you never have to change who you are. You just have to adapt your style for a little while to help other people like you so you can then show them how brilliant you are. But read, go on a course, learn, have the profile done and get it done from a reputable supplier who teaches you properly would be my advice. Well, 100%. Yeah, it's a great investment in yourself. And there's some stellar advice there. So thank you very much. For anyone listening as well, I think what interviewers are trying to do is actually trying to throw you off because they want to find out how you react in different situations. So sometimes it's done in a very silly way, or mm. sometimes it's done with a bit of a wild card question. Mm. So, you know, a very common one at the moment that we're seeing, Sarah, is people being asked, you know, what's the failure you're most proud of and things like that, which, you know, you could argue is not the best way to go around create an environment where people thrive at interview. But what I would say is one thing that has helped people with this is this idea of the porcupine technique that we talk about, whereby if somebody throws you a wild card question, as if they're throwing you a porcupine, just throw it straight back. <laughs> so rather than trying to answer it, when you feel that kind of anxiety start to come on and your state starts to change because you're going, oh, shit, I, did, I had not researched this one. I'm not prepared for this. And you feel that initial anxiety, just chuck it straight back. So, for example, if somebody says, what's the failure you're most proud of? Just go, wow, what a great question. Wow, there's been a few. Would a personal failure or business failure give you more insights at this stage? Very so good. The moment you chuck it back, you just allow your mind a bit of time to settle, buy yourself a bit of space, and the brain's awesome, isn't it? Because in those few seconds, it will process what's going, plus you'll get a little bit more context from the interview in terms of what they really want to know from that question as well. What do you think about that? I love it, and I love it from a neuroscience perspective, and it's what we do. So I used to train a selling skills course or an influencing skills course, whatever you want to call it. One of the biggest tactics people found most useful or skills was being able to chuck this porcupine back we didn't call it that but I love it <laughs> it's not uh, yeah. so what happens is as soon as someone gives us something that puts our tension up their tension's gone up and so is yours which means your ability to answer the question and be calm about it and come across rationally is reduced so the first thing you need to do is to calm it down by empathizing or showing interest and chucking it back with a question. So the empathy piece is, wow, that's a great question. Now, as you, if you're asking me the question, you're going, hey, I'm great, thank you. If your brain can't help it. So you're like, okay, that's lovely. That's a great question. I'd have to think about that a sec, but tell me more, what is it you're really looking for? So in that time, exactly as you said, your brain is calming down to allow you to think, but it's also calming the other person down because even though they're chucking it at you to see what you do, I promise you it makes them nervous too because it's uncomfortable. They know it's an uncomfortable question. So immediately you calm yourself, you calm them. And all of a sudden you can have a nice conversation about, oh yeah, well, it was this time where I, I learned from doing it wrong? And is it Edison who said he made a, how many light bulbs before he made the right, you know, you learn from your mistakes. So you can have these conversations in a much more jovial, convivial way. Mm. everyone being calm so what you've suggested is spot on well done Love well, okay. it. well thank you and I really like the fact that I hadn't thought about the effect on 
the interviewer themselves. That's a lovely insight. Thank you. LinkedIn. We've obviously interacted on there. I've yeah. seen you on the platform quite a lot over the last couple of years. What's your thoughts on LinkedIn? Any tips for the listeners? What have you got out of your interactions and the broadcast and things that you do on the platform? Be yourself and don't be afraid. It really is that simple. When I, it took me about a year to become myself. I look back at the post now and they were me, but they were like, I'm quite sure why I was being so careful, but I do know why I was scared. I was scared of being seen. I was scared of being wrong. I was scared that my thoughts didn't count. And that was real imposter syndrome stuff going on because it was a massive change in how I was working and wherever there's change, there's fear. So I worked with my coach and she was like, what do you want to say? I want to say this. We'll say it. And how would you say it? Well, I'd say it like that. Don't be rude. Don't come in on things that really wind you up because you'll just get into an argument. Just be nice and help people. And now my mindset is, how can I help people today? How can I get it across in a really nice way that won't offend anybody in any shape or form? And I don't always get it right. Sometimes I do poke the bear a little bit, but for different reasons. And enjoy it, but be prepared that people will respond to you. And actually 99% of that will be great and it'll be really enjoyable. And the 1%, you just have to learn to go, thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Don't feed the trolls. And in terms of what that's given you, how have you benefited from overcoming that imposter syndrome on LinkedIn and, and diving in a bit more? It has allowed me, I've grown in so many ways in myself. So my coaching practice has benefited, not just in the point of view, it's full. And everybody, I, someone asked me a while ago, do you get any business from LinkedIn? I was like, no, I don't get anything. And I looked back and went, every single one of these clients has come through an interaction from LinkedIn. So it's everything. It's how my business occurs. But it allows me to show up as an expert in the field confidently in the fields that I'm in. I'm being asked to speak at places about what I'm good at, which really allows me to grow even more. The more confident I am, the better I am for my clients and the more confident they can become. So it's a whole circle of benefit it's benefiting everybody and it's great fun it's quite addictive yeah well it's designed <laughs> it's quite that so way. addictive to it but it's quite addictive yeah no it is but well, it's designed that way right that's exactly it's supposed to be addictive and it, de- you. it does yeah it does okay no brilliant insights thank you a couple of uh, quick fire ones then if we can before we wrap mm-hmm. so any books that you really recommend that have helped shape your thinking three immediately First one, when lockdown hit, one of the first books I read that changed everything about what I did was, oh, completely gone out of my head. I'm going to come back to that one. (laughs) Why is it that that happens? That's a real block, isn't it? Oh, Good to Great by Jim Collins. That was it. Sorry. Oh, classic. The reason that that made such a difference to me was I thought this is so good and it's about 20 years, 30 years old, but it's so relevant to everything that I do. And that I decided to do some videos on that, which went onto YouTube. They are there and they're going to stay there and they're not very good, but I want to see how far I've come. And I was brave enough to go and talk about that book and my thoughts on it. So that broke a seal of going live. The other book is actually up behind me, which is Three Feet from Gold. That is the book that stopped me pontificating about writing my book and got me started writing on it a few months ago. And to just go for it. I mean, anybody that's, thinking about doing something and they're holding back you've got to read that I find it utterly inspiring and then there's another one which is the chimp paradox which I think so many people have read I've read it probably about four or five times and every time I read it I remember more but that was really my learning ground along with my NLP practitioner course about how the brain works and what's going on when we're in a fear response what stops people from doing things if you've not read that yet and if you've only read it once read it again because how our minds work underpins every action that we take and every result that we have. It's the start of everything. And if we don't understand what's triggering us and why we're thinking what we're thinking, we can be making some big mistakes. So yeah, those are my top three. And I can't believe I forgot the first one. <laughs> good, yeah, Good to Grey is the best business book that's ever been written. I Isn't think. it? It's just so so straightforward and easily understandable. And I've tried to model all our previous businesses based on that hedgehog concept and on getting the right people on the bus and, and kicking the hedge, off. And... Yeah, the hedgehog is probably why I smiled when he said the porcupine, but I talk about the hedgehog concept a lot when people are thinking of moving out of 
corporate life into setting up their own business, what do I do? We we work with the hedgehog concept. A lot of mm. people use Ikigai as well. Mm. I find Ikigai a little bit too much. I like just to stick with the top line concept and go from there, but that's just the way my brain works. Uh, but yeah, it is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant book. It is. Okay. And is there a quote that you particularly like or that you find yourself repeating? God, I don't know if it's so much as a, as a quote, but there's something that always stuck in my mind, which was, you know, you get these pictures come up going, well, this is really motivational. And it's a picture of the word I can't and it's cut. Yeah. I can. Yeah. That has always sticks in my mind. And every time I get stuck, I think you're thinking you can't. You absolutely can. You just need to find out how. And I've read so many, I've got so many quotes and a lot of them actually drive me mad because they give you a little taste of what is possible, but they don't tell you how to do it. So I'm like, oh, forget about it. I'll figure out how to do it instead. But the I can't to I can is uh, just really powerful. Yeah, which leads into the Henry Ford quote of whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Absolutely. Which, which is a good one, I think. Yeah, so, it, so. it really is, really is, yeah. So that's good. So uh, final question, what you're excited about for the rest of the year? I think this year is going to be the most mental year I will ever have. So I've just started writing my book, thanks to the Three Feet from Gold, reading that and making me go, just get on with it. And I'm going on a course. Uh, so investing heavily in myself again, uh, not just to learn about what I do, which I'm always learning about, but to actually develop myself so I get even better for my clients. And I want to be doing more speaker gigs. I've got a couple coming up, which I'm really looking forward to, but I want to be doing more of that. And I'd really love to get out and see real humans. Mm. And imagine going back on stage with real humans rather than all being on little screens. I mean, it's fine. I, it's great working like that, but I can't wait to get out. So very busy, full practice, great clients, writing a book, growing myself, being better. It's going to be a really cool year. It's really exciting. And for anybody that's listening that wants to follow your progress, interact with your content, or maybe approach you to work with them in some kind of way, what's the best way for them to do that? Probably best to go either via LinkedIn. So easy to find on LinkedIn, Sarah Farmer, uh, executive coach, but I've also got a website, which is www.emr-consulting.co.uk. So there's a page on there that you can contact me and, and ask me anything. There's also a load of free content on there as well, which I'm populating more and more. So videos, short videos on how to do things. There's a bit on communication skills. There's also freebies actually for people who want to look into communication and how to show up at interviews even better. So there's a preliminary program, which is totally free that any of your people that are listening to this might want to have it. It's there, they can take it. And then if they want more, there's more to have. Okay, brilliant. Well, make sure you go and check all of that out. I think it's clear from this episode how much Sarah's got to offer. So thank you again for freeing up some time. It's been really good to uh, talk everything through for, with you. And I think there's loads of tangible tips there. So yeah, thanks very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. And it's lovely to meet you properly as well. Likewise. Take care. Take care. You've been listening to the Career Jump Podcast with Andrew McCaskill. For more resources and information, just head over to the Career Jump website at www.execcareerjump.com to supercharge your job search and start making moves. Let's get to work. Let's get to work.